thank you for coming so early for my talk. <laughs> it's a nice surprise to see so many people. And I'll uh, present the results of our about three or four year hunt for um, features of slash and burn cultivation. And uh, probably you know better than me because I'm a soil scientist what slash and burn cultivation is about, but just a short summary. Um, Sweden agriculture is a type of farming when fields are burned, cropped for short periods of time, and then abandoned for a forest fallow. Um, in, there are many types of Sweden agriculture, but forest Sweden or forest slash and burn cultivation is central. Um, purpose of burning is uh, land clearance preparation of seed bed, uh, release of nutrients, and that's very important for poor sandy soils or stony so some, uh, soils, and elimination of weeds. <clears throat> Um, it's believed that slash and burn cultivation was practiced at least since the uh, Bronze Age, uh, but became much more common in the early Iron Age with the advent of um, iron implements. Um, until recently, until 20th, uh, mid 20th century, uh, slash and burn cultivation still existed in northern countries with poor soils such as Scandinavia and northern, <coughs> northern Russia. And it still exists and it emerges every time when people are in poverty and there is forest under him to burn and clear for agriculture. Um, there are very good descriptions of um, recent and northern types of uh, Swedens or Sweden technologists um, compiled by Petrov and published in Russian, so not many people actually read it. But it's a, it's a very um, important source of information because he used all um, available uh, sources of information. So what, um, what would be the sort of central or main part of the uh, slash and burn uh, technology or te te uh, slash and burn approach to forest clearance would be a small size of the field, uh, preparation of trees for fall falling by girdling, uh, trees failing formation of uh, fuel bed when uh, the whole tree often with roots is placed on the ground, then burning either in spring for uh, summer crops or in summer for fall, uh, fall crops. <clears throat> then sowing uh, in warm ashes, and ashes are central for this uh, technique. And then harvesting for one to three years. Um, common crops are not necessarily uh, cereals, but also pulses, uh, turnip, um, and even goose food, a kinopodium. Uh, this short cropping period is followed by abandonment in a forest fallow for several decades. Um, usually, um, just a second, um, and usually sandy soils are preferred for Sweden agriculture for many reasons, but first of all, it's warmer and the vegetation period is much longer on sandy soils. <clears throat> Um, so even though we have good descriptions of slash and burn cultivation, morphology, soil morphological features of um, this farming techniques or that should, should result from this farming technique are unknown. And it's amazing because um, presumably there should be everywhere, at least on sandy soils, because we believe that swing cultivation was quite ubiquitous on poor soils, infertile soils. So if um, um, we hypothesized what morphological features should be uh, typical for Sweden soils, we thought of um, a high amount of charcoal and ash combustion products in the Sweden layer. And ash consists of carbonates and phytolis. So once the carbonates are removed from the profile in the course of several years, there still should be a 
significant amount of plant or, or phytoplankton. And because they are tiny of silt size, then we assume that there will be increase in the silt fraction in the soil. Uh, then because the debris are raked or spread along the surface, there should be diminution of charcoal, so uh, it should be small, but um, evenly distributed within the sweet layers. Uh, then because ash is alkaline, there would be a peak, even a short term maybe, but peak in alkalinity, and peak in erosion, so this um, uh, ashy mud slurry would be moving along the surface, uh, redepositing, transporting, redepositing the uh, combustion degrees. And finally, because it's a small opening in the forest, it should be forested quite rapidly. So if we uh, think of palynological signatures of Sweden, it would be very similar to a, to a small uh, scale forest fire. <clears throat> and uh, when we worked on archaeological sites, and um, we have a long-term project in Tatarstan and Bulgar area, we found a number of um, sites with soils that agreed with our assumptions, or, um, and should be Sweden soils. But it's always good to have um, sites where Sweden's are doc documented, and it was a very lucky coincidence that uh, we met with, um, with Pile Thompson, who discovered, documented um, Sweden areas in Estonia that were um, affected by slash and burn cultivation in the 19th centuries. So we used the sites to check whether really the features that we expected as <coughs> Sweden soils to have are there. So the study area was in Coral Nation Park Estonia, and here are the maps that Philly uh, found in archives. Um, and you can see that pink areas on the map are uh, marked as bushlands, and uh, bushlands are not called so not because they're covered by bushes, but because the trees that grow there uh, are not allowed to mature. They are repeatedly cut at the young age and converted into Sweden's. So it's amazing that in Estonia, where some uh, permanent fields exist for thousands of years, they coexisted with Sweden's on uh, knobs on hilly areas. So we uh, analyzed several sites, and um, there are sites uh, that were uh, affected by experimental Sweden's sites that are documented as Sweden's allocated now in the forest, and forest sites that are like, uh, affected by wildfire, because it's essential to uh, find the distinctive features of both natural fires and Sweden's. And here are three typical uh, pictures that uh, we encountered. So on the left, it's a plow land that uh, was um, used in the experimental Sweden. So the very top five to seven centimeters are darkened by charcoal. On the right, uh, the top photo uh, depicts the result of the forest fire. And it's a typical cinder gray color, clusters of charcoal, clusters of large fragments of charcoal. And um, the lower boundary is not as even as in the plow soil, uh, but uh, rather um, uh, reflects the lateral movement of materials in suspensions along the surface. Uh, on the lower uh, right, you can see actually the portray of the swing cultivation. And the lower boundary is not even, also it doesn't show lamination typical for the lateral movement of suspensions, but it has very typical traces of insects. And such high density of traces of insects in the coniferous forest is highly unusual. Um, this finger-like uh, bo uh, burrows construct are constructions of so-called sweat bees, of digging bees. And um, uh, these digging bees that create this finger-like pattern are known for being main pollinators of 
non-cereal crops, such as turning, for example, or peppers in um, South America, um, or whatever you can, or beets, and so on. Um, so um, we traced this uh, dark colored layers with scalloped lower boundary in a number of sites. And uh, they have specific uh, color code according to Mansell. The thickness is varying from five to 10 centimeters with a medium thickness of seven centimeters. And um, even the color and lower boundary is quite, is quite uh, diagnostic of the Swedens. Moreover, in the lower uh, parts of slopes, there are numerous uh, Sweden layers, uh, so they are stuck, and you, we can, you could see up to four layers of swings in the same profile. So, um, if beside the macro features, there are uh, meso features of uh, Swedens, and they are a, a huge proportion of phytoliths, up to two hundred of up to two hundred uh, thousand of. Um, phytoliths per gram of soil, and an enormous amount of charcoal. Every gram of soil has at least one uh, fragment of charcoal. Of a typical size, that is about, a uh, median has about uh, five millimeters. Um, so if we imagine what the soil surface looks like after the burn, it's ash and um, uh, in this ashy slurry, when charcoal is moving laterally, it gets rounded. So it, uh, uh, the ash and silt form coating on the surface of the charcoal. And it looks, uh, it almost uh, um, doesn't look like charcoal, but it is one. Here you can see that there is charcoal. And it's quite important because these time capsules um, can be also covered by iron deposits and uh, be preserved for hundreds and thousands of years, and they are datable. So we can try to carbon date them and uh, know when exactly the Sweden was uh, formed. Finally, there are different uh, types of fuels in the uh, Swedens and in forest fires. If, if for forest fires, it's typically a huge pro high proportion of bark in the charcoal assemblages, whereas in uh, the Swedens, there are always components of the canopy, either buds or um, needles. And uh, finally, the composition of charcoal in Swedens uh, usually shows a high proportion of deciduous taxa, and they are not burned easily during the fires. Mm -hmm. And just to show you that once we know what the Sweden looks like, we can just look at the photos and say it's, it's a portrait of Sweden. And retrospectively, we looked at the sites where we worked in the past, and we could um, create maps of uh, sites affected by Sweden. And some of them are uh, dated. Others can be dated, because once we know that it's Sweden, uh, we can easily uh, obtain radiocarbon dates for them. Finally, uh, because we know what it looks like, even um, express tasting with uh, soil auger can show you uh, how many Sweden layers are at the base of the slope, and we can uh, delineate contours of the Sweden. Thank you.